Hey, Truth Seeker, welcome to Season 1, Episode 1 of Aletheia Quest with Alan Farner, where we are on a quest for truth. Unsurprisingly, I'm Alan, an ordinary guy who lives in a small, friendly, high plains town east of Denver. We broadcast every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern on WRMI's shortwave frequency of 9955 kilohertz and their internet stream, along with having a podcast. You can learn more about those by visiting aletheia.quest, or if your ability to spell Greek alliterations isn't so great, go ahead and visit truthquest.link, truthquest.link, and it'll redirect you there. Aletheia Quest is just starting up, so this week, and maybe a couple more, I'll share talks I gave in the past. Today's is Clay or Butter, where we look at God's responsibility in hardening people's hearts. Is he responsible? Well, good morning, everybody. I want to uh, test uh, trivia with people. Uh, I'm afraid you youngins, you're going to fail miserably at this because I'm going to go back to the 70s. Anybody familiar with uh, Claro Wilson Jr.? Claro Wilson, you're familiar. Very good. Anybody? How about Flip Wilson? Familiar with that? Some people familiar with Flip Wilson. That's his uh, Claro's stage name. Now, who was Flip Wilson? He was a comedian, right? If you're if you're less familiar than others with his comedic genius, Philip Wilson was the first black entertainer to be the host of a successful variety show. As a matter of fact, it was the number one variety show shortly after it came out in in nineteen that was in nineteen seventy, and in nineteen seventy two it was number two entirely on television, beat only by one other show. Anybody guess what that was? What? No, not Johnny Carson. Oh, this is actually, people don't realize how popular this show, this show was. Now, imagine a chair, a guy sitting in a chair. Right, well, all in the family, right? All in the family. But that's pretty incredible if you think about it, right? Being number two, a variety show, which, you know, they used to be popular. I don't even know if there are any of them on TV now, are there? Can you think of a variety show that's on a... but? Variety shows used to be decently popular, but to be number two across everything is pretty incredible. So he was very talented. And he Flip, he flip portrayed many different characters, um, but perhaps the most mer- memorable one was one called Geraldine. Does anybody remember Geraldine? She was a woman who was pretty sure of herself in Wife of Killer, but she was pretty sure of herself, and she uttered famous lines like, when you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you're not. Or what you see is what you get. And if you're a computer nerd like me who's played in web with HTML editors, that second saying I didn't realize until I was doing this research is supposedly where you get WYSIWYG. Have you ever heard that term? What you see is what you get. It used to be when you did HTML, when you made a web page, you had to put all the funky tags in to make it work. Then they came out with editors, which were pretty rough early on, where you could actually just type it and see what you were putting together, and it would do the coding underneath. But to think that Geraldine, of all people, is responsible potentially for WYSIWYG, which is just the acronym for what you see is what you get, it's pretty incredible and quite an effect of a comedian. But I can't speak for others from the 70s, but there is another line from Geraldine that I identify more with the 70s than the other two ones. Does anybody know where it is? You, you seem familiar with her. What's one of her famous lines that I haven't mentioned? The devil made me do it. That is her line. As a matter of fact, Geraldine, well, Flip Wilson, um, was so successful with that mantra that he named one of his comedy albums, The Devil Made Me Buy This Dress. The devil made me buy this dress. Now, are there any women out there who have tried that line with their boyfriends or husbands? And that work actually got the best comedy recording Grammy in 1970. Well done. Very well done. Now, we as Christians know much better than to say the devil made us do it, right? We all know that. But I want you to imagine now, you're Pharaoh, and we won't go ahead and try to figure out where Pharaoh is right now, but you're Pharaoh, and you sit down and decide to read Exodus. I mean, it does have you as a lead character, right? In Exodus, 
you turn your reading through and you end up in the fourth chapter. So let's all go together because we're all pretending to be Pharaoh, right? Now pretend you've read the first three chapters. You're ending up in the fourth chapter of Exodus. And you're much better at finding it than I am. The fourth chapter, and you're reading through and you see Moses returns to Egypt. And you get to verse 21. And this is what you read. So we're in Exodus 4, 21. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles I have put in your power. But I, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I will harden his heart so he will not let the people go. Now at this point, you might scratch your head a little, decide you don't like that much, and figure you'll go to the New Testament, because we all know that the New Testament's a lot easier to read, right? And you've heard about this Paul guy, heard good things, so you decide to go to the first book that Paul wrote in the New Testament, which is, Mike, where's Mike? Mike, what's the first book that Paul wrote in the New Testament? Mom can help you cheat. It's not Matthew, right? It's not Mark, it's not Luke, it's not John, it's not Acts. Romans, exactly. So you decide to go to Romans because you've heard good things about Paul. And now, playing the part of Pharaoh is Matthew. Playing the part of Pharaoh is Matthew. Mike, I mean, sorry. Mike, sorry, Mike. Yeah, this is you. This is you, man. And so you as Pharaoh decide, come on up, come on up, because you're going to have to talk into this. You as Pharaoh come up and you read this as you hit chapter 9. Go ahead. Starting, You're going to read this whole section. What shall we say then? Is this injustice? Uh, just one moment. I just noticed I should let you guys get there too in case you can't hear the volume. So you're going to go to Romans 9 and you're Pharaoh looking at verses 14 through 18, okay? So we'll give him a second. Romans 9. Verses 14 through 18. I'm sorry about closing up the room. I got the M right, didn't I? At least I didn't call you Gertrude. It's too bad for me. It's a good name to make up anytime. You're gonna, you don't choose normal names if you're going to make one up. Okay, are we there? Nine? Go ahead. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Fifteen, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I, whom I have compassion. 16, 16. So then it depends not on human will extortion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show you power in, your, in you, and that my name might pro be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy, and whomever, whomever he wills, and he hardens, whomever, whomever he wills. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I may, uh, without warning, have you come up again, so be prepared. Okay, now you're frustrated, because your luck is no better in Romans than it was in Exodus. So you figure, what the heck, I'll go back to Exodus, I might as well read the remainder of my interactions with Moses and see how it is. And you find eight more times where the Bible says in Exodus that God hardened your heart. A total of nine times in Exodus. Now, unlike Geraldine, you as the pretend Pharaoh wouldn't say the devil made me do it. What would you say? What? God made me do it, right? And isn't that kind of a fair conclusion? God hardened Pharaoh's heart, raised him up for that very purpose that he might show his power in him? Because who can resist God's will? No one, right? Now, we could actually go with Paul's answer to those who ask who can resist God's will and respond, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? But I personally believe that the Bible offers additional insight that right now we are only seeing half the story. 
And the Pharaoh is probably like us. How many times in a situation where you have done something wrong and you reflect on the situation, you focus on those things that somebody else did wrong to you? Overall, you're the person who hosed it up, right? But somehow as you reflect on that situation at work or the little argument you might have had with your spouse or your friend who didn't, you know, cook the hamburger the way you wanted, you focus on the things they did, right? And you know what? Pharaoh, when he was going through Exodus, also would have run into chapter 7, verses 8 through 15. So let's pretend we're Pharaoh going through 7, 8 through 15 and see if we have any excuse for saying, God made me do it. So chapter 7, verses 8 through 15. Once you guys get there, it should be pretty easy. I've stayed in the same book, right? So if you don't keep closing your book, you're all set. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff. Oh, sorry, let me just check something quickly. I apologize. Sometimes when I put it on here, what I end up doing is putting the verses down, and I realize afterwards that I wrote the verses down wrong. But let me just find it real quick here. Eight, eight through fifteen. I apologize. I could tell when I was getting started because this was Pharaoh, not Moses. So eight, eight through fifteen. And and when I give you the notes, Trudy, make sure I write that down there so this is not wrong. Huh? Eight, eight through fifteen. So then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said. Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people. Anybody ever had to deal with a whole bunch of frogs? Kind of a slimy circumstance to be in. And so Pharaoh's figured this out. And I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And we would all agree frogs belong in water, not in our houses, correct? And he said, tomorrow, Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So taking care of this is going to prove who's in charge? That God's in charge, right? So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards and the fields, probably quite a stinky situation. And they gathered them together in heaps and the land stank. Well, there you go. It was a stinky situation. But look at this next line. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, I like that word. When Pharaoh saw there was a respite, he what? He hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. He hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So this is interesting because we could have gone to some references where God predicted he would harden his heart. But here, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? And if you were to look at Exodus 8, 31 through 32, just a little later on, assuming I wrote down the reference correctly this time, And the Lord, another plague, this time flies. I I think I prefer frogs myself. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh, what? Hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Hmm, so now we have two times the Bible said, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Pharaoh, Pharaoh himself. And not only that, he did it after God showed mercy to him by removing the plagues, right? His reaction to him taking away the frogs, it's a harden his heart. Because people could say you can get mad at somebody when there's something bad to you. God something nice for him, right? And he hardened his heart. Now, John MacArthur also couldn't help but notice the apparent conflict between God hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh doing it himself 
So he wrote, This interplay between God's hardening and Pharaoh's hardening his heart must be kept in balance. Ten times the historical record notes specifically that God hardened the king's heart, and ten times the record indicates the king hardened his own heart. The Apostle Paul used this hardening as an example of God's inscrutable will and absolute power to intervene as he chooses, yet obviously never without loss of personal responsibility for actions taken. The theological conundrum, another good word, the theological conundrum posed by such interplay of God's acting and Pharaoh's acting can only be resolved by accepting the record as it stands and by taking refuge in the omniscience and omnipotence of God who planned and brought about his deliverance of Israel from Egypt and in so doing so also judged Pharaoh's sinfulness. So ten times, sort of even Stevens, right? Ten times God hardened his heart, ten times Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And by the way, if one of you just did math then you, or remembered and said, why do you only go with nine? It's because Dr. MacArthur says, the Bible specifically says, he hardened Pharaoh's heart ten times. But if you look at the last reference, and you can see this online at some point later, the last reference actually said, he hardened all the peoples of Egypt's heart. So, yeah, I guess that counts Pharaoh, but to me... And I actually probably would have locked one off the, the ten times that Pharaoh hardened his own heart because it doesn't actually use the word heart or harden. So I'm a stickler. I'm, I'm that computer nerd, that mathematist who likes being accurate. But either way, at least nine to nine times, it says. And, and I think we've gotten past the half the story situation at this point because we've seen the other half, right? Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But now we are left in a quandary because what? Because the Bible appears to contradict itself, Right? Did God harden his heart, or did Pharaoh harden his heart? And kind of no better than Paul in Romans, MacArthur doesn't actually solve it, does he? He just tells us that we should accept the record. But again, I think we can do a bit better than that. I think that we can try to answer this. Let me ask you this. When you think of the Bible and you think of a trial, and not a trial as in somebody trying you, but as in the court case, who do you usually think of? Yourself at the judgment, right? People at the judgment. But who's actually on trial? God, of course, right? If you think about it, I mean, right from the beginning, you don't even get to the, through the third chapter of Genesis when the father of lies accuses God of lying. We don't look at that together, but go to chapter 3 and you'll see it. He, he says, you know, God said this. Well, he's lying to you. He doesn't use those words, but it's a direct implication. He's always been on trial. And in this case, he's on trial because it's either one of two things. He's on trial because he forces people to do things and then blames them for it, or he's on trial because he inspired people to write contradictions. And if I did either way, if I made Mikey, uh, Augie do something bad, or I got up here and I said one thing at the beginning of the sermon that contradicted with something at the end of the sermon, you'd have every right to say, Alan, what's going on? So first, let's handle God doing, forcing people to do bad things. Let's take a quick look at that. And no matter how we decide to deal with the quotes that say that Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God, we have to remember James 1, 13 through 15. James 1, 13 through 15. So let's turn there. We there? 13 through 15? Let, let who? Anybody there? Let no one, right? Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own own desire, then desire when it has conceived birth, gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Should we ever say God tempted us? Should we ever say God forced Pharaoh to do bad things? 
I'd also think about Hebrews 3.13, I won't make you flip there, but it says there, it says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called a day, that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We choose to sin, and we allow that sin to harden our hearts. And it's interesting because in the Bible study this morning, we talked about the deceitfulness of lusts, right? They all tie together. That The Bible is a cohesive whole, even when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart and then says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. We know the answer, no matter what we look at, that God did not harden Pharaoh's heart in that he forced him. So I think we've been out with a, accusation number one. Right, we've got the ability, we have now proven God not guilty. But we're still stuck with number two. God contradicting himself. Now, I'm going to be up front. There is no way, using scripture, I'm going to be able to prove to you that he didn't contradict himself. Partially because proof depends on the recipient as much as it depends on the person giving the proof, right? However... In court, does the person in the U.S., does the person who is the defendant have to prove their innocence? Right. All the defense lawyer has to do for their client is prove reasonable doubt. Okay? All he has to do is come up with some other scenario that might explain how it happened or, you know, why his uh, client couldn't have done that, what his client might have been doing instead, or perhaps a scenario that makes somebody else sound guilty. So I am going to go ahead and go with that line of defense. Is that okay? I'm going to talk about reasonable doubt here. And, you know, I will admit, by the way, that even though it's uncomfortable, it is true sometimes in the Bible, that uh, if this is not enough for you, you might as well go with the trust God approach that John MacArthur suggests. Because anytime you try to explain finitely an infinite God, you will run short. So I'm going to go with two tacks in my defense. And one of them is this. Let me ask you. With certain individuals, co-workers at your store, um, spouses, friends, do you know how to push their buttons? Yes, right? You know what to say or do. That will set them off, right? And is it not true that sometimes you don't actually have to do anything wrong, right? That you actually can do something right, and you know it's going to set them off. Who's responsible for their reaction, though? If you press their button, if you know what they're, how they're going to react, who's actually responsible for the reaction? They are, no matter what, right? They choose to go off the handle. They choose to get angry. They choose to punch the wall. They choose to quit at work. They choose, they choose to do it. They can say whatever they want, but the fact that you knew what they would do and react doesn't mean it's not their fault. And especially if it's something, there are people who will fly off the handle if you tell them about Jesus. Is that wrong to tell them about Jesus? God commands you to tell them about Jesus if they'll go off the handle. So let me ask you this. Who's responsible when they go off the handle? They are. So that's my defense number one with reasonable doubt. That basically God knew how Pharaoh would react to the light that he gave him in those miraculous plagues. He knew, fair, and, and the plagues were righteous, this is not a case where God was doing something wrong. But he said he hardened Pharaoh's heart because he knew how Pharaoh would react. But in reality, who hardened his own heart? It was Pharaoh. Just like the person who flies off the handle at you at work chooses, they harden their own heart. They choose to show the anger. Defense number one. Reasonable doubt yet? Somebody say no. Can you say no, Winslow? Okay. Winslow, because he is a very difficult person to convince, says no. So I'm going to try another analogy. Some people may consider this lame. What do we got here? This is going to set Augie up. Sorry. What? Play-Doh, right? Which is kind of clay, right? What's this? I'm going to use this analogy. What is it? This is butter, right? 
I would not bring cheap margarine for you folks. I care about you. So just imagine what I do is I come up here and I, let's, I didn't do this. I could have. I went to Rick. I borrowed a heat lamp from Rick and Diane's, and I clipped that heat lamp to this communion table, and I put the two of them here, and I come back here and return to preaching. What happens to the Play-Doh? It hardens, right? What happens to the butter? But it had the same force applied to it, right? Didn't it? It's the same heat lamp laying on this bright... All right, what color is that, guys? Bright some color, Play-Doh, and this nice yellowish butter, which for all I know has got color added to it, too. Same thing done to it. The difference is that the effect is dependent on the recipient. Correct? Is it not? And with the heat, the Play-Doh hardens and the butter melts. The reaction is dependent on the recipient. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days... He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Over 2,000 years ago, the Father showed himself more clearly than ever before by sending his Son, who is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And just as God knew exactly how Pharaoh would react to the light that was in those plagues and into the removal of those plagues, God knew there would be two kinds of responses to the name of his son. From Mary wiping his feet with her hair to crowds screaming, Crucify him! He knew there would be two reactions. And those two same reactions happen today. Just as the heat lamp, the Rick and Diane's heat lamp, will melt this butter or dry this clay, the actual result is dependent on the recipient. And some may consider this a lame sermon illustration, but the ultimate heat lamp is God, right? The light of the world as seen in Jesus. And he's shining on us right now. Will he harden your heart? Or will your heart melt under his love? No, there are no contradictions in the Bible. It's just two ways of describing individual reactions to the same light that we all receive. God leaves no one out. And may the light of the Lord have a different effect on you than it did on Pharaoh. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Season 1, Episode 1 of Aletheia Quest with Alan Farner. I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me by visiting aletheia.quest or truthquest.link, truthquest.link, and choosing Contact Alan. Remember, there is truth. You can know truth. Truth doesn't contradict truth. Truth matters. Truth is, I care about you. See you again next week.